Hello, my name is Vitaly. I'm a software engineer at Meta. And today, my colleagues and I will talk about our approach to data processing while developing, training, and using PyTorch models. We will cover common industry problems and solutions offered by Torch Data and Torch Arrow libraries. And we will show how it works in the real world. There are multiple aspects that need to be taken into consideration. The first one is data size. Originally, PyTorch data login was developed with random access pattern, and it doesn't work well with jump from research datasets to terabytes and petabytes of data. To make access to larger datasets easier, we are placing streaming data processing as preferred way to access and manipulate data. Yet, we are keeping index-based access available for specific scenarios when data size is not that big. The second problem is the way we used to write datasets. Every advanced user had to implement everything from scratch, creating repetitive repositories for different datasets. For that reason, we decided to introduce data pipes as part of Torch data repository to encourage code reuse and promote standardization. Data pipes is our way to construct operations graph. On this slide, you can see how image for the light data set becomes a sequence of data pipe operations. Lots of existing datasets can be constructed using a collection of provided data pipes. Data manipulation primitives like filter, map, do not require special introduction. There are flow control functions like max, fork, demax, which allows having multiple paths in the graph. And for machine learning concepts, we provide pipes like page and page collate. Third data repository have many other data pipes for data and data order manipulation, like shuffle, group by, zip, zip by key, etc. In addition to data flow control, we provide ways to read and parse the data. We support reading from the file system, HTTP, Google Drive. There is also support for handling archives like tar, zip, RRF, and others. And text formats like JSON and comma or tabular separated records. We continuously work in this open source community to introduce many more, recently welcoming TF Record Reader and S3 Loader. It is easy to add new data pipe following guidelines but in most cases, a dataset can be constructed as a composition of existing pipes. In addition to the comfort of constructing graphs, it is also easy to modify them. In the given example, we are migrating from local file system to the cloud with a chain of colorful lines. While exploring the market of data process solutions, we discover multiple implementations of data loading. While they are excellent for solving specific domain problems because of the nature of the data, models, or hardware, they are highly uncomfortable for users because of various API and incompatibilities with higher-level frameworks, such as Torch Lightning, Composer, and others. As part of Torch Data, we are solving this problem by decomposing data processing API, aka Data Loader API, and backend implementation. They are named Data Loader and Reading Service. And you can see usage example on this slide. Pay attention that switching from one reading service to another one do not require a user to change the training loop of data loader initialization. Last but not least is data exchange format. Arbitrary Python objects are suitable for quick hacks in research, but they create a bunch of performance and portability problems on production. The perfect solution would be to enforce single data standard Torch Arrow, but it will significantly impact flexibility. For that reason, we are aiming to keep the best of two worlds. By aligning syntax between Torch Arrow and data pipes, we allow users to seamlessly migrate from research to production. When we will share more details about Torch Arrow. Thanks, Vitaly. Um, hi, everyone. This is Wenlei, and I'm here going to talk about Torch Arrow. So, first, let's start with motivation of Torch Arrow. When launching ML models in production, almost every ML model has a number of tabular style data pre-processing that is non-trainable. So they are often known as feature engineering or pre-proc. And to take an example, in the recommendation domain, we often have this so-called dense or sparse feature transformations, such as bucketize, try to discretize the continuous values into buckets, and all you know, taking the hash of the features and the computer ID overlaps. Similarly, in the text domain, there are a lot of string manipulations that requires before you can uh, feed the tensor to the trainer, such as, you know, tokenize the sentence and uh, doing some trim style operations and uh, look up in the vocabulary to convert them into numeric values. 
So today, how do people solve them? So it's often ad hoc. Um, where in some domains we see developers using Python dictionaries or lists to represent and write Python transformation. In some other use cases, we have seen it's encoded as tensors. So for example, for an array of big int, you can represent them as an element tensor plus an offset or length tensor, where the element tensor contains the flattened values in the array and the offset or the length tensor encoding the structural information of the array. So Python transformations, we often find it's less efficient and uh, doesn't scale well into very large scale. And while and encoding as tensors allows us to solve the efficiency problem because now you can call into a highly efficient uh, tensor operations, you could also customize it uh, by writing a touch script uh, custom ops. However, it often requires some kind of hidden contract on the encoding. For example, is the nullable tensor included in the struct? And uh, is the second tensor means offset or length? Because you know some user-defined transformations assumes the input tensor encoding the length. So if you if the actual data comes with the offset, you need to manually convert them. And those are error prone. So with all these observations, we develop a Torch Arrow, which tries to help the structured data in the PyTorch ecosystem. So what is Torch Arrow? At a high level, it's a Python data frame library in spider pandas, but it has special tweak into the structured data support, especially for nested array or struct. We also implementing common tensor correlations. For example, for dense features encoded with a struct, nested struct, it's often it can be hand off to PyTorch as tensor formats in one uh, tensor correlate call. This allows us to easily plug into PyTorch data loader in the data pipe. And uh, as the name suggests, it supports the arrow in memory column format uh, interop with the arrow copy. So it allows, so this allows to leverage the ecosystem with external readers, given arrow popularity in the ecosystem. Similar to PyTorch, it supports multiple execution uh, runtime. It has a high performance CPU backend by the Velox. We also have a graph mode, which allows us to trace a Torch arrow program into an IR. So makes the optimization and the future lowering to other engines possible. As a future work, we do want to support a GPU backend as GPU pre-proc allows GPU pre-proc and co-work on the trainer is so important. Finally, by integration with the Velox, it provides a high performance C++ UDF also in support. So to recap, Touch Arrow is about first using Arrow as a unified memory layout, so integrate with the ecosystem. Second, it integrates with Velox for the CPU evaluation library and the user UDF authoring. Finally, it provides a data frame API to express a transformation language. Let's take a concrete example about the Criteria dataset. Criteria dataset is one of the largest open source dataset in the recommendation domain for researchers to evaluate their models. The raw text data contains many, many rows. Each line is basically 14 columns, with the first, first column as label, 13 dense feature columns, and 26 categorical feature columns. And we represent dense features and categorical features as nested struct with 13 and 26 fields, respectively, as showing on the left bottom side. So those files are could be, you know, for example, stored as parquet to allow, you know, columnar read and the more efficient transformation. So the transformation logic in our example looks at following as on the right side. First, it try to fill those no values with zero. And then for dense features, it would apply log x plus three transformations. And of course, people may want to tweak it together with their model, such as 
tweak the three to some other constant or apply a different transformation such as rigid or box cox transformation instead of log. For categorical features, it will be wrapped into a single element array, so it can further be converted into a, a more a very efficient uh, jacket tensor format for training. So how is this pre prog logic expressed in Torch Arrow? So here is an example of, you know, we write a criteria pre prog function, which takes the data frame as input and the data frame as output. First, for the fill no operations in the first two lines, noted uh, the nest struct is actually modeled as a nest data frame in Torch Arrow. This allows automatic broadcast behavior. So instead of, you know, looping over all the subfields, you only write one line saying fill no and then broadcast operation to all the sub column. Similarly, uh, the second part, uh, applying the plus three and the log operation is also automatic broadcasted. So you only write one line. And finally, to apply the sparse feature transformations, you do loop over the subfields and applying a UDF called array constructor. So it wraps the one element into a single element array. Uh, you can imagine more complicated uh, UDF being called here. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand, hand over to Yingxin about uh, industry case study. Thanks, Wenlei. My name is Yingxin, a software engineer at Meta, and I'm going to go through an industry case study how we do the training job. So now we have data pipes to make the ML authoring pipeline composable and easy to use. And we have Torch Arrow as the data frame library for pre-processing. And finally, in industry, to handle the intense online pre-processing demands, we also have a production deploy disaggregated pre-processing framework called Data Pre-Processing Service, or DPP. DPP iteratively reads and transforms mini batches of training data, and we can scale the preprocessing nodes for each training job. Let's first go over the architecture of the disaggregated reading ingestion framework. It's mainly composed with three tiers, the storage tier, the data reading compute tier, and the training tier. So it's pretty common to have megabytes of data requests for a typical recommendation training job. So we need a disaggregated storage tier to support large-scale training at Meta. It's typically stored in Hive in the structure of Map. And in the data reading compute tier, we mainly have a data plane and control plane. In the data plane, we have DPP Worker. This is responsible for fetching data from Hive, decrypt and decode the data. We also extract the features for training. And we do a pre-processing transforms with Torch Arrow and turn it into tensors. In the control plane, we have a DPP master to control the whole data reading and pre-processing job. This is also built with reliability support such as fault tolerance and checkpoint. Finally, in the training tier, we have DPP client embedded on the trainers to fetch data from data reading compute here and push it into accelerators. So with DPP master, workers, and clients as the execution backend, we mainly have two types of data reading services to support different use cases. First, we have the disaggregated reading service to perform the data reading and pre-processing job in a separate DPP cluster with multiple uh, workers and masters nodes. And this is connected to the trainers to read the data. This is preferred when the training workload can benefit from independent scaling of the training and reading nodes. And typically, this is used in the recommendation use cases. We also have a co-unbox reading service to support 
the scenario where there is sufficient CPU capacities in the train terminals. And this is often used in content understanding use cases like vision or text training. So here is an example of how we connect the ML authoring frontend and the DPP backend. First, we read the data from the source data pipe, and we do transforms and pre-proc with Quartero. We do shuffle bash in the typical ML authoring job. We also collate it into tensor format. And to take advantage of the DPP backend, we provide it as a reading service to connect with the data loader. So the data loader takes the data pipes and reading service and puts them together. In summary, the left side is the front end. The right side shows the backend execution engine. In the front end, we have data pipes and torch arrow. And in the right side, we have DPP workers, DPP masters, and the client for the execution backend. And we can connect these two together with data loader. So we have very streamlined experience to support our research to production. Now I'm going to hand off to Vitaly for the summary. Thank you, Xing. Okay, now let me tell you what is available and what is coming up next. Torch data is better stage right now, with data pipes available to develop new data sets. It is getting new data loader API and reading service this summer. Torch Era is also in open source as prototype and will release beta version this year. We are currently working on various additions to the Torch data, such as expanding the collection of data pipes to make datasets development even more effortless. Adding highly demanded snapshotting functionality, also known as fault tolerance and restoration, and simultaneously blocking debuggability, which contains better error messages and profile. This leads to a plan to focus on performance and distributed aspects, like heterogeneous cluster support and offloading computation work from training machine without dataset rewrite. To get more information about both projects, please refer to our GitHub repositories. And you can also install Torch data using pip and conda. Thank you.